So it's two thirty-eight, and uh, welcome back. And if you're watching on the live cam, now it's a proper it's a proper thing to watch. Normally, it's just me and Mark, and sometimes it's just you, and sometimes it's just me if you're abroad doing gigs or something like that. But this time, you get to actually look at a top movie star because Eddie Marsden is in the studio. Hello, Eddie. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's very nice to see you. Again. You're looking particularly well and trim and healthy and. Oh. Well, I knew you had a you had a cam on. I've got the makeup. of you know, I've done it. I'm I'm, I'm breathing in as we speak. Is that right? <laughs> is that right? Can we sorry? Can we do something from the very beginning? Okay, I, I've been a huge fan of yours for years. You know this, okay? So, um, and I always said Eddie Marzan, and because Mike Lee said to me Eddie Marzan, okay, and then Marzan, Marzan, and I, then apparently we asked we asked your agent, and he said, oh no, it's pronounced in a different Eddie. Who is what's the absolutely definitively correct pronunciation? Marsan. Marsan. Thank you. Thank it's a soft S, yeah. Okay, so Marsan. Yes, French, yeah. It's yeah, Marsan. so Mike Lee was right. Well, we were told officially by your people that it's Marsan like Tarzan. No, it's Marsan. That's the my my old man says Marsan, because all the East Enders can't say Marsan, but it's Marsan. How, and what do you say? I say uh, uh, I say Marsan unless I get Angry, then I, then I turn East End and I say Marsden. <laughs> <laughs> so they're both okay. Yeah, they're fine. And do you say Abba is back or do you say Abba are back? Did you catch this? This was on the news report. They said Abba is back. They had a strap line that went across it. Now, obviously, because Abba have got they got. Some In case you songs. didn't know, Abba have I, reformed. It, yeah, it would be it would be our back. Of course, you would say the Beatles are back. Exactly. You wouldn't exactly. say Abba. Yeah, I don't know. That's slightly different because the Beatles is a plural. Is, is okay, it a no? Plural? Okay, okay, you so, would so, say so. Manchester City. Are champions. Yeah. You wouldn't say there is champion. I mean, no. it'd be ludicrous. <laughs> now, more importantly, if somebody made a film about the life of somebody else, what is that film called? What is the the genre of a film about somebody's life? The, the thing that's a, a shortened version of biographical picture. How would you say that? How would you say it? Biopic. Biopic. Exactly. There you, you go. Say, Thank Decide. you very much. There we go. Everyone Thanks, Eddie. Thanks for saying... coming in. Anyway, no. <laughs> <laughs> everyone saying biopic, which is which is ludicrous. No, that sounds like you cut something away. and You're going to send it for test. Exactly. What's wrong with the world? Hey? Exactly. <laughs> anyway, before we start talking about Entebbe, Neil in Portsmouth gets in touch. Um, as you have Eddie on the show this week, can you ask him this? I was an extra alongside Eddie on the disappointing British thriller Empire State in 1987. Yes. That's going back. He may remember dancing for a whole day to Don't Leave Me This Way yes. in the elaborate nightclub set. They had to play that track as the original music they'd written for the film was too slow and boring to dance to. Anyway, at the time, Eddie was clearly convinced he was going to make it as an actor. We were more sceptical, says Neil. Can I ask him if he, re if he always remained that confident or were there times when he thought it would never happen? No, actually, Empire State was my epiphany to become an actor. I was a, I was currently at that time I was an apprentice printer, but I used to dance a lot. I used to I used to love what we would call rare groove and James Brown and or Northern Soul, mm -hmm. and they picked me up on a, a a club in Hackney Road and they said, "Would you come, guys come and be an extra?" And me, me and my mates went, and I saw Jamie Foreman do a scene where he had to walk across the dance floor, and it suddenly hit me that I can do that. That's what I want to do. And that was the first time I really thought about being an actor, was on Empire really? State. And I never got to see the film because I was going to go and see the film at the Mile End ABC and then um, half of Bethnal Green were extras in the film and they burnt the cinema down before we got to see the film. So it must have been terrible. I've never seen it. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Are you, not are you not intrigued to sort of find a copy? Or? No, no. <laughs> no, I've never, I've never, I've, there's loads of things. I've, I've never seen Limehouse Gollum. Really? You said to me you've seen Lama. Yeah, I've never yeah. seen Lama. Yeah, yeah I've you're, never seen You're it. really good in it. It's, oh, it's, I really much. like that film. Yeah, you're yeah. really good in it. Oh, thank you very much. Did you? I mean, and, and also there's, you know, the, the revelation moment. Yeah. When it's, yeah. It's, it's really quite. What, so you didn't see it because you don't like to watch yourself on screen or because you're too busy? Or? I don't have time. I honestly don't have, And on, on, if it's not on a flight, I probably ain't going to see it. Wow. So, because you've done, I mean, you've done more, you have a more, more than 100 film, yeah. TV. Yeah credits so that just makes you like the most busy actor of all time if you're too busy to check your own work <laughs> that's well great. yeah i suppose so it's just but it's just you know you put your head down and you get on with it you know and i've got four young children so some films you can't put on for them no you sure know? so you can't but a lot of your films you yeah. can't put on for them <laughs> yeah so you kind of can't you know and i usually fall asleep by the time they go you know i read them a story and i fall asleep with them so you don't get time to 
watch anything else. But you don't have a... It's not that you have a problem with watching yourself. It's not that you think you'd be sort of critical of it or because some people just really don't like watching themselves on screen. No, I never have that problem. Okay, no. you just literally don't get around to doing get, it. to get around to doing it. Is there I, not like a huge part of you... Because I want to know... You know how because we I asked you before you came on I said have you ever been made a movie that then turned out you weren't in you didn't know about it and you did you said there was a case yeah um, are you not just curious to know how it worked out and how everything mm -hmm. apparently not no not really no some films I am and it's not that I wasn't with Limehouse Gollum but it was kind of uh, you just get don't get time to sit down and watch them of all the performances of yours that you actually have watched <laughs> which was the one that you sat there and thought this is pretty good actually that's what I want to do. Um, quite I quite like um, the best of men. I thought I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that because I thought the story was a beautiful story. My worst performance was Hancock. I hated Hancock. My performance in Hancock. Why? It? Because I just done Happy Go Lucky, and if you watch Hancock, I, I literally finished Happy Go Lucky on a Thursday, and on a Sunday I was in LA and they gave me a bazooka and I had to blow up Will Smith. <laughs> and the character in Hancock is that is Scott from Happy Go Lucky. Really? With, Still yeah, with an American accent. <laughs> So he's Scott with an American accent still believing in conspiracy theories yeah. with a bazooka. That's yeah. a dangerous that's, yeah. a, that's yeah. a dangerous combination. Anyway, speaking of bazookas, uh, we should as you you haven't just come here to pay a visit and just see how we're doing. No, he did. He just came in to correct our pronunciation on a few words. Oh, hang out. Yeah, he's, he's got an afternoon off. I'm off now. You're going yeah. to the pictures. Eddie Marsan is here because in Tebby is a new movie which comes out uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Uh Older viewers may well remember the other Entebbe films, that Radon Entebbe, which came out sort of a couple of years after the actual incident. And Victory Entebbe. They were both, they were, this is one of these weird things. They were in the cinema at the same time. I mean, I think you're slightly younger than I am, but I remember really, you had the choice. You could either go to the ABC and see Victory Entebbe, or you could go to the Odeon and see Radon Entebbe, and they were both playing at the same time. I went to see Victory Entebbe because it just happened, well, it had Linda Blair in it. So that's what, but there was, it was one of those weird cases in which two movies about the same historical event in the cinemas at the same time. So here we are many decades later. Eddie, tell us the story because there'll be a lot of people for whom this is the first time they'll have seen this story. Well, in in um, in Tebe is the story about East German um, terrorists who, along with um, the Palestinian Liberation Movement, um, hijacked a plane in Athens and rather than take it to... Uh, take it to Israel, because it was mainly there were mainly Israeli passengers on board. They took it to Entebbe. They released all the French... It was a French plane. They released all the non-Jewish passengers and they kept, kept all the Jewish um, people in, in the Entebbe airport. And Idi Amin was uh, facilitating the hijacking. And then Shimon Peres and Yitzhak Rabin had to decide what to do. So they came up with a plan of Entebbe where they had to fly all the way to Uganda with um, the Israeli Secret Service. And and the raid on Entebbe was the release of the hostages, which was actually very successful. Yitzhak Rabin is the prime minister. Shimon Peres is the defense minister. And that's, that's right. You. Yes. So, so you are... Uh, so, uh, all the scenes that we see you in, they're the decision-making decisions uh, in taking place uh, in Israel. Tell us about how you how you become Shimon Peres and get into the mind of this man who, if I remember correctly, he was he was unique amongst some Israeli politicians because he was not a soldier. This is yes. uh, th this man is a pure politics. Yes. Well, what when Jose asked me to do the film, he said I want the film to be an answer against populism. So I then had to ask him what function you want Shimon Peres, the character Shimon Peres, to play in this film. And he wanted the film to be about people making very difficult decisions in a very complex situation. And Shimon Peres was... David Ben-Gurion was the man who founded Israel, and he had a team working with him, and most of them were soldiers. The only one who wasn't a soldier was Shimon Peres. So I took that as a, as a hook... So when he was in a room with other um, soldiers, I, I always wanted to play this man as a politician. Whenever I play a character, I, I find I choose an essence, and I and I, that's always my point of reference. And my point of reference was Shimon Peres was a politician. Be a politician is always a political decision. And 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 what's beautiful about the film, and why I'm really proud of the film, it's not a film about heroes and villains, and it's about an, an heroic raid. It's about people making a difficult decision in a complex situation. Everybody starts the film with an ideological bias, with an ide ideology, and they have to let go of that ideology to solve this problem. Uh, let's let's play a clip uh, from the movie uh, featuring Eddie as Shimon Perez, as he says, and Leo Ashkenazi as Yitzhak Rabin. Shimon, let me explain the situation as it stands. 
We have no intelligence. We only know the hostages are in the terminal, nothing else. What if they moved them around last night? What if now we have people sitting in the middle of them with guns and grenades? As soon as they know we're coming, they start to kill the men, the women, the children. So, they are selecting Jews and you want to negotiate? Shimon, if we don't negotiate, if we never negotiate, if we're always at war, then we will make our country a prison and every one of our citizens will be a prisoner. Is, so, the answer to populism that you're director was after is in portraying this particular raid this particular situation as incredibly complex and not a very very straightforward decision yes because it wasn't a very straightforward um situation the reason um for instance with with perez and rabin the reason the raid came about wasn't necessarily because they thought that we can do this perez was was trying to put pressure on rabin because he just lost the um labor party leadership election so he was trying to to put rabin into a corner where he had to agree to this raid and he, and then he would get the blame for it but if he didn't do it he would get the blame for that as well so it was all about the politics there were, nobody was perfect there were very underhand things going on and I, I don't mean that to be criticism critical of anybody but that's the reality of things and and jose said he's very tired of people proclaiming there to be simple answers to situations. And when you say Jose, you mean Jose Bidi, who's exactly, the director? Exactly, yeah. 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 So that appealed to me as an actor because I often play characters. I, I often play characters who, are, who who have contrasting elements to them, paradoxical elements to them, you know. And and I wanted to play it within this. The, 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 the Perez that I play in this is not the Perez who received the Nobel Peace Prize at the age of 90. This man was a man who was full of ambition and wanted to become the Israeli Prime Minister. And the screenplay is by Gregory Burke, yes. who, of course, very well known for, for Black Watch. When did you did you accept the role, having read it, or was it how did how did what what made you say yes? I read it, and then I went to meet Jose, and he told me his idea of it because I was very loath to make a kind of um, born identity, you know, a kind of a macho film about guys, yeah. and I just thought that doesn't interest me. And when he told me why he wanted to make the film. I decided that that was something that I wanted to be part of. One of the the, the most unexpected things a film does is, as I said, we've, we've seen this story told in television movies and in movies, but there is this weird dance mm. thing which goes all the way through, which is not what you would expect yeah. from that kind of movie. Do you want to just explain how that came about and how much you knew about that beforehand? Um, it, when I was working with Jose, Jose is Brazilian, so he's a very rhythmic... Um, he's, he, he's filming and the way he makes a film and the way he cuts and everything is very rhythmical, it's very musical. And we were talking, he was talking about this Churchill quote when someone said to Churchill, we should shut the theatres during the Blitz. And he said, well, if we shut the theatres, what's the point of having a war? <laughs> why, why are we fighting? And he loved that idea. And he loved the idea of the Israeli soldier saying to the, there's a young, there's a character of an Israeli soldier who goes on the Entebbe raid and his girlfriend is a dancer. And, and he says, I fight so you can dance. And I think Jose had a choice. He could have made the film about the raid and be all really macho and show these guys going in and there's lots of blood. But he decided to turn it into the dance. And what I admired about that was this could have been a very macho film. And in, 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 in essence, it's, it, it, it transcends that by going into this dance. Because the dance is a beautiful dance. They start off as very Hasidic Jews. And at the end of the dance, they're virtually naked. And it's a beautiful metaphor for what he was trying to do with the film, I think. And and, and in that dance, which is um, uh, from the Bathsheba Dance Company, yeah. they the, all the dancers are, are with chairs, and as you say, they take their clothes yeah. off. And and there's one... I'm just trying to make sure that I've got this metaphor right. And there's one dancer, who's the girlfriend that you mentioned, yeah. consistently falls to the yes. ground. Yes. And, I, and she, either she can't get up or she won't get up to fit right. in... The formation, and I'm. I was trying to think. Is, does she? What does she? Rep, what is she representing? Or maybe I'm overthinking this. No, but I think that's great that you, that you that it makes you think that. I don't know. I to be honest with you, I don't know because I don't know the guy who choreographed it. But what I love is that it's making you think that. But there's a section in which the in which the the director of the dance says to her, "You have to commit to it." Basically, he says, "You're not. You're you're not." You're you're holding back. You're not fully yeah. committing to it, and you see that she's wearing knee pads because obviously every time she does the fall, it's a very physical thing. And it and he says you have essentially he's saying you have to throw your, yourself into yes. it. Yes, and I took that as being in co connection with what Eddie was saying that there's a difficult decision to be made, and in the end, you have to you have to go with it. Yeah, yeah. Plus, you're a dancer, so you look at it as you just told us that you that you used to be 
do quite a lot of dancing. So. I used to, yeah, I used to like to dance. Do you still dance? I just danced in a film called White Boy Rick for um, f- uh, that I did with Matthew Mahoney, and they got me to do this big dance scene in a club in Chicago. Did you dance with Matthew Mahoney? With no, Mike? I danced. He's, he wasn't in the scene, but I did, <laughs> I did the whole big long speech of me just dancing. Are you doing Northern Soul dancing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but now I look like an, 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 a retired accountant. <laughs> <laughs> in the um, in the clip that we just heard. And it's a it's a line that comes up, I think, two maybe three times. Uh, Yitzhak Rabin says, as Prime Minister, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, unless we negotiate, there will always be war. Mm-hmm. And it, and it felt as though that was also one of the things that your director was was wanting to get because that speaks very specifically to present day politics and you know the situation between Israel and Palestine still is not sorted. But clearly, that seemed to be the director saying. This is this is what I'm saying. Or the writer, yeah. because that, the writer. That, that's I would assume that was in Gregory Burke's script. It was, yeah. it was. But one of the great things about doing the scenes that we were doing within the Israeli cabinet was all the all the all the actors were they were all Israelis, so their their opinions of the Israeli Palestinian conflict are as varied as ours. They're not all pro Netanyahu or anti Netanyahu. So they, you know, and they're a bunch of Jewish guys who love to argue with each other and debate. So you sit there and you soak it all up. And and because uh, Jose is is a very kind of improv, he improvises a lot and allows me to come up with stuff. Me and Lior would come up with stuff. That scene you that scene you did there. That me and Lior would kind of work that out in a sense. With but with the writer as well. In, in no no disrespect for the writer, but he kind of sets the framework. It's like writing a piece of music. Then you ask two musicians to come in and jam and and add a bit. And me and Lior did that. But it was all informed by the debate that was going on with the Israeli actors. One of the things that every actor who plays a, 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 a real person and has to wear a certain amount of makeup in order to sort of fit is they always say, I hate the makeup, I hate the makeup, it's really difficult to work under. You have a certain amount, obviously, with each other. Yeah. Comfortable or uncomfortable? Um, relatively comfortable. Oh, really? Yeah, wow. I, didn't, I didn't find it too, too bad. I didn't find it too hard. It came, I, I did, um, I'd played Bob Dylan about two years before and my wife had done the makeup with Bob Dylan and then when we did um, Rabin, um, Perez, I realised that I I needed to look completely different. I you I I, I didn't think people were going to believe as me as Rabin uh, Perez, so I had to change the way I looked, right. and I found it very comfortable. Well, wow. uh, Liz in Winchester on this text, Eddie's portrayal of Ludwig Gutmann in The Best of Men was stellar. My dad trained at Stoke Mandeville after the war when Gutmann was there. I wish he'd been alive to see it. Uh, Steve Williamson in Kessingland. I must confess, I've not seen. Uh, uh, Eddie, I haven't seen much of uh, Eddie, but Still Life was one of the best films I've ever seen. I was Still in tears at lovely. the end. Uh, thanks, Eddie, for an excellent performance. Can I just ask you about just while we while we have you here, um, we're going to do uh, our Avengers movie review in a bit, aren't we? I, I think that's my job. Yes, Infinity. <laughs> I think I'm required to do that. Yes. And uh, you you tweeted a few days ago about an actor. Uh, who now has his own poster? Uh, Benny Wong. Yeah, yeah, and and because and, and you were all struggling actors together. We just, were. Just yeah. tell us about him. We were all we were all struggling actors together. And um, who's the actor? Uh, the, there was a Chinese actor who used to do a TV show called The Chinese Detective. Do you remember the guy? Our David. Top team are now looking that up, and it's David. Be uh, well, anyway, he was awesome. kind of the most successful Chinese actor. David Yip. Da- yeah, David and, we, Yip. and and he was and and Benny said when we were all young actors, and Benny said. I knew I was in trouble when I was when I just left drama school and I was signing on and ahead of me was David Yip who was queuing up to sign on and he was the most successful Chinese actor this country's ever had and and Benny was was always a brilliant actor but he always knew that it was going to be a struggle because the the roles weren't written for him you know and be, and nowadays thank god they're casting people not based on race they they're casting everybody and everything and, and we accept that but at the time, Benny was really struggling. And to see him now with his own Marvel poster and to know how much he struggled and to know how great he was, it's just, it's great. There's hope for me yet. Yeah. <laughs> and you, that's right, because if only you could get more work. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, you have been slacking a bit. How many, 100 and how many movies? But what was it? Because because uh, you said that he was like the best of us or he was certainly, yeah. he was clearly fantastic. Yeah. Because there was there was something, there was something about him and, and the way he worked in his performances that was just so subtle and 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 so I remember watching. He was very lyrical, Benny. There was something about him that was just so gentle, and it was something that I aspired to, and I tried to copy to a certain extent when I watched him. 
So in a sense, I did take a lot from him. So I have to say that at that stage, when he was younger, he was an example for me to follow. And of course, you worked with Paul Bettany in Gangster Number yeah. One all those years ago. And of course, yeah. Paul Bettany now is such a central uh, part of the Avengers. Yeah, pack. yeah. So, so it's just you, really, Eddie. You're right. It's just me. <laughs> Come on, Eddie. Yes, you're absolutely. Uh, you in in Entebbe, uh, you have an interesting uh, selection of nut. Uh, when when you're in the cabinet meetings, you seem to be eating an awful lot of nuts. I yeah, that was quite good. I thought that was. I can see how that was an aid to decision making. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I remember doing that because I wanted him to be enjoying the difficulty that Rabin was in. So I said, let him sit down and be quite arrogant and eat nuts in the prime minister's office. Yeah. Of all the films you've made, what's the one you're most proud of? Um, Happy Go Lucky, I think. Happy go lucky. And the people still shout in Raha Pop yet you in the They street. do. The funny thing is, when when they had all that fuss with that um mural in Brick Lane that yes. had the, the yeah, yeah. Jewish looking people around the monopoly and stuff, yeah. the, the the triangle with the eye above it was En Raha. It was, wasn't it? That, that was En Raha yeah. above that. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So Scott, your fantastic conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah. He could come back with his own movie. He could, he could. What are, what are we gonna see you in next? Deadpool two and Entebbe. Right. So Deadpool two is a week after, a couple of weeks time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. there we are. You're, you're in. You're in I'm that in, universe. In the, you're in the universe. It's basically easier to mention the films that you're not involved with. Really. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. So uh, Deadpool two, and then uh, and Tebby comes out in a couple of weeks time. Eddie, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming. Thank in. you, guys. Love to speak.